inviting me. So I'm going to start just with a, with a heads up because I got COVID, so I'm, I'm a little bit sick, like in case my voice is a strain or anything, but um, it's generally fine. So um, also, because I'm not sure, like, what what's everyone's background, please, you know, if you have any questions, anything is unclear, or I'm assuming that you know something that, that you don't know, feel free to ask. So, um, so in this talk, I'm going to mention uh, how we can use signals that are from a completely different nature to learn about the large scales of the universe. In particular, I'm going to be thinking of how we can use electromagnetic and gravitational waves to combine them and test cosmology. So let me just start with a very uh, you know, general review first on where we are currently in cosmology. So, so currently we have on the one side like a very basic menu of ingredients in cosmology that are mainly these three points. First is that we have to make assumptions about gravity that is given by general relativity. The other one is that the universe is highly homogeneous and isotropic on the largest scales of the universe with small irregularities that basically describe the, the largest scale of structures. And also the universe is not a static, but instead it is something dynamic that is expanding. So these simple assumptions together just with particle physics can already give you know, a pretty good idea of, of the evolution of the universe from the Big Bang to today. Um, however, you know, certain complications mainly uh, driven by observations have you know, appeared throughout you know, the history. And this is the special menu with three additional ingredients that we need to include. So first is the assumption that, that there is some amount of dark matter that currently we assume that is modeled by some non-relativistic particles, some kind of massive, massive particles in the slow motion. And, and this ingredient had to be added uh, to uh, fit uh, galaxy observations. Then we have dark energy to, to explain the observed accelerated expansion of the universe. And in the current cosmological model, it's just given by a cosmological constant, you know, just some constant that we put in my hand and I will come back to this point later. And finally, the third extra ingredient and assumption is that there is some inflationary period during the early universe and that you know, it's just an, another accelerated expansion period. And typically, at least in the simplest scenarios, it's just modeled by some new fundamental scalar field um, that you know, was responsible for this accelerated expansion. So, you know, putting everything together, current, the current model uh, with observations tell us that this is the fractional energy density of, of the universe today, where about 70% is given by dark energy, 26% is cold dark matter, and only 5% is what we actually know from particle physics. Um, so, so certainly, even though this model and all of these special ingredients that we had to add it do feed observations, it is a phenomenological model in that sense. We do need to understand better what are these dark, uh, dark matter and dark energy components that are actually crucial and dominant today. Um, and in this talk, I'm gonna mostly focus about dark energy. So just to give you a little bit more detail about the current cosmological model. So I already mentioned that dark energy is just described by some kind of constant that we put in by hand. This constant has a specific meaning. It, is, it represents the energy density of this component. And the fact that it's a constant means that even though the space is expanding, it doesn't dilute. But it also has this extra property, which is that effectively it generates some repulsive gravity. And that's how it, it drives this accelerated expansion of the space. Um, so in principle, of course, we would like to explain, give some origin uh, to this uh, dark energy. 
component. And what has been discussed a lot is the fact that maybe it corresponds to the vacuum energy of all fundamental particles. So we know just some from quantum physics that the, the vacuum energy is not exactly zero. And uh, actually the vacuum energy, if it gravitates, it does have these, all of these properties that it doesn't dilute, it generates effective repulsive gravity and so on. So that's why this kind of explanation was uh, initially proposed. However, there is an issue with that. And the fact is that current observations require this energy density of dark energy to be of this order of magnitude in terms of electron volt. But if you make some kind of rough estimations of the vacuum energy of all the particles in the universe, it is at least 55 orders of magnitude larger than the value that we need for two feet observation. So, so this is the kind of the current problem in which we are right now, which is that basically we don't have a theoretical explanation for dark energy that is at least satisfactory. And I, I like this kind of half joke quote, um, which is never believe in an experiment until it has been confirmed by a theory. Um, so we do need you know, some kind of explanation to this. And people, you know, they don't like ideas. I and mean, over the last decade, there has been like a, you know, like a zoo of different kind of models uh, trying to give some different origin to dark energy. So, so this picture is trying to show like different kind of deviations from general relativity uh, of these different uh, models that try to address dark energy. So GR is starting point. And then typical, a lot of dark energy alternative models, what they do is that they add an additional fundamental field that really corresponds to the dark energy field. So instead of assuming that it's some kind of constant or vacuum energy, there is a new fundamental particle that is really responsible for these uh, observations of the universe. Um, but then, you know, you have so many options of what this particle could be, a scalar, vectors of a tensor, and then within each class, you could have a lot of possibilities for how this field interacts with itself and how does it interact with gravity to lead to this accelerated expansion. So, you know, there are a lot of possibilities and, and the hope is that you know, we can at some point have enough observational data to, to test uh, some of these models. So this is kind of the current state of the, the theoretical, I think, state of dark energy. Now, from a more observational point of view, this lambda CDM model uh, works very well. I mean, I, and I think it makes sense because all of these components were brought to feed observations. So the basic cosmological model has six free parameters and all of those uh, have been measured to about 1% of precision. Um, and most of the cosmological observations come from two, uh, uh, two situations. One is by making uh, observations of galaxy and galaxy maps. So this is like what this is showing. This is actual data showing, um, you know, each dot here, regardless of the color, it represents a galaxy. And, and the radius is showing how far the galaxy is from us. And the angle shows like the, the sky location. Um, and the other probe that we use for cosmology is a cosmic microwave background, which is some uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation that was emitted during the early universe and that has been propagated you know, pretty, free, pretty freely uh, since then. And you know, it makes up this uh, photon background. Um, so, you know, as I said, as a phenomenological model, it works well for feeding data, but actually now that we are reaching more and more precise obs observations, some issues have started to appear. And now even from an observational point of view, it's not completely free of issues. So probably you have heard about this H naught tension that has been like a lot of attention in the last few years. That has to do with the fact that uh, the current expansion rate of the universe is parameterized by this uh, number H naught. 
And all of the different observations uh, are shown here for what the value would be and, and like its error bars. Uh, and the main issue that is, is, is arising here is that observations that make assumptions about the early evolution of the universe and then then they have to kind of propagate all of the assumptions up to today to arrive to a constraint on H naught, end up giving values that are kind of low compared to all of these other classes of observations that do not make any assumptions about the early universe. These are like what we call local observations that basically look at very nearby objects to constrain H naught. Um, and, and the issue is that this separation into these two kind of classes of observations um, is, it has persisted over the years, like these different collaborations have made like different checks with different reanalyses and it is still there. And it has even been growing over the years because these observations have been shrinking the errors. So each one independently, they feel every year more confident that they are right, but they are in disagreement with each other. Um, the most constraining probes are like the most famous ones mentioned come is this one from the early universe that is Planck, that you observe, it's a collaboration that observes the cosmic microwave background. And then for the late universe is this one, it's, it's choose. Um, so, we still don't know what's happening, but it may like it may be an observation that is hinting possibly to the fact that we're making wrong assumptions about our cosmology or universe. So certainly in the future, we will have a lot of more of these electromagnetic data from galaxy surveys and the cosmic macro background. Here are some examples of uh, telescopes that will become online or in the next few years. But in this talk, I mostly want to talk about gravitational waves. The fact that we have traditionally used these electromagnetic probes to test cosmology, but now we can actually, now that we have gravitational wave data, we can actually use it for cosmology as well. So, um, so gravitational waves are just these ripples or oscillations of the space time and they tend to be very weak, so we do need very gravitationally strong objects to be able to observe them. Uh, the typical situation that we have in mind that represents the current detections that we have seen comes from binary system of compact objects. They could be either black holes or very compact stars like neutron stars. And what we typically observe is, is this string. It's just kind of a measure of how, how the distance you know, uh, you know, or the length is, is changing as a function of time as a gravitational wave passes. And, and the first stage in this binary uh, system is the in spiral, which is when the two binaries, you know, they're gravitationally bound to each other. Uh, so they're moving in, in this orbit, but they're emitting gravitational waves in that process and losing energy. So the orbit starts to shrink until they eventually merge and form a bigger object, a bigger black hole. So, so this is what the signal looks like from this kind of uh, objects. And what we basically observe is like the information that we have is the amplitude of this signal, how the amplitude evolves in time, what is the phase evolution, how does the frequency grows in time, as you can see, you know, the wiggle, uh, you know, uh, the frequency grows as we approach the merger. And when the amplitude peaks is typically what we identify at the moment when they, when they actually merged. So we already have about like 90 of these gravitational wave observations from binary system, most of them black holes, a couple from binary neutron star system. But in the future, and when I say the future, I mean the next decade, um, we will have another kind of ground-based gravitational wave detectors and even space-based gravitational wave detectors that will be just way more sensitive than, than the current ones. We will have, we could be detecting like a million of these gravitational wave events per year. Um, so we want to use this data. And how do gravitational waves probe cosmology? It's through their propagation. So we have to imagine that these, there are these compact objects 
that are emitting the wave, you know, the, the details of the compact objects, their orbit and so on, determine the formation of the wave. But then after it has formed, uh, these waves are gonna propagate for you know, billions of years over this homogeneous anisotropic universe. And in this propagation, they are going to be sensitive to, you know, at what rate the universe is expanding, this parameter H naught that I mentioned. They're gonna be sensitive to dark energy. You know, is dark energy something like a new field that is dynamical or is just a constant? And even it's sensitive to homogeneity. So, you know, if in the propagation, the waves encounter a galaxy or some kind of homogeneity, then uh, there will be some imprint. So, so in, in, in the rest of the talk, I want to mention kind of like specific examples in which we can use gravitational waves and we have already used it to, to test cosmology. And I'm gonna focus on the first two points on how we can use it to test, test H naught and dark energy. So let's start with the, with the case of H naught. So how are gravitational waves sensitive to the expansion rate of the universe? So uh, it turns out that the gravitational wave signal from this in spiral process. So this means when the objects are relatively far apart and in this moving in this uh, orbit is pretty generic. It only depends on general relativity on, on how gravity behaves. Um, and it doesn't really depend on the specific details of the objects. So they could be black holes or neutron stars, so on. So, so these uh, first uh, wiggles that we observe are very universal and we actually know how the frequency of these wiggles grows as a function of time. And it's only determined by one parameter. So this F here's the frequency as a function of time as the, as the two black holes are closer to each other. And it only depends on one parameter, which is, it's called the chirp mass, but it's basically just some kind of effective mass that combines the two masses of the two objects. So really just by observing what is the value of the frequency of your signal and how it evolves in time, you can already obtain these parameters. And then you can now look at the amplitude of your gravitational wave signal, this is H. And the amplitude is, it's gonna look more or less like this, so it has some amplitude that grows in time together with the frequency. And then it has some you know, oscillatory behavior. But the important thing here is that I want you to focus on this. So this is a strain that we already saw before H. F, the frequency F, we observe it directly and the mass, this chirp mass M that I mentioned, we get it just by frequency information from the first step. So I want you to focus on this. These, the amplitude of the gravitational waves decays as the so-called luminosity distance. Basically, it's a combination of how far the signal is together with the fact that the universe is expanding and therefore the energy of the waves is getting diluted. And through this distance, therefore, is when the amplitude of the gravitational waves becomes sensitive to the expansion of the universe. So we can follow uh, a procedure to, to use gravitational waves to constrain the expansion rate H naught. So first from the gravitational wave data alone, you can obtain the value of this mass that I told you and the value of this DL just by observing the amplitude of your signal. Then, as I said, the luminosity distance contains information about how far the source is and the expansion rate of the universe. It typically goes like this. It's C, C is the redshift, so measure of how far the source is, and divided by H naught. So if we have the value of DL, and if we had the value of the redshift, then we could obtain some constraint on H naught. And the way of obtaining the value of the redshift is not through the gravitational wave data alone, that, that doesn't give us a redshift, but you could do it if this binary system that it, uh, emitted the gravitational wave also emitted an electromagnetic counterpart that you can, basically some electromagnetic radiation that you can detect because electromagnetic radiation, people know how to, you know, identify, you know, where the source is located uh, just by detecting the radiation. 
So this is what happened in, in 2017, in which you had two binary neutral stars. So at the moment these, these stars merge, you have to imagine that there's some kind of explosion and there is emission of electromagnetic radiation. So people detected both the electromagnetic and the gravitational waves, and that allowed us to obtain a constraint on H naught, as I mentioned. So this is the result on the constraint of the current expansion rate of the universe. So here, basically, we're looking at the probability, um, the probability that it takes different values. So the, the, here, here, we have to look at this curve. So this is the main result. This is where the signal, the probability peaks, where it is more probable, but it still has a very kind of broad distribution. And this is what these, uh, the, this gray region is trying to highlight. So within this whole gray region, uh, you have like a 98% of confidence that it should be within this gray region, which is still very wide. Um, so as a comparison, in green, you can see the result, the constraint from Planck, which is what I told you from the, the observation of the early universe, which is, has, is very thin, meaning that it's a very uh, precise observation. And in orange, or kind of brown, you see the result um, from the late time observations, the local observations of H0 which is less precise, but in any case, these two Planck and Schuess observations that I showed you in the, in the previous plot uh, are much, much better, much more precise than this gravitational wave event that gave you like the equivalent of this entire gray, gray region here. Um, however, the main point is that, you know, this is a single event. It's just one single observation. And the good thing is that it is a completely independent probe uh, compared to these other two that I mentioned. And if we actually had a hundred of these kind of events, we could constrain H naught to a 1% of precision, which would be comparable to the, to the, green, the green region. So it would be now competitive. Uh, but you know, whether this will happen or not depends on a lot of factors, but you know, it is in principle possible. Just for you to know, uh, I also want to show you this other plot, which is kind of improved constraints of H naught from the single event observed in 2017. So it is kind of equivalent to the previous plot that I showed you, but people here used additional information to, to make more precise uh, or less uncertain this observation of H naught. So here we have again in this, in this thin band, is the result from Planck. This other is the result from Schuess. And the black and the red are two different uh, works in which they use, again, this uh, 2017 gravitational wave event to set some constraints on H naught, which now they look much narrower than the previous plot that I just showed you. But it is still, you know, it has a lot of uncertainties still compared to the, the Planck and Schuess uh, so it is still not competitive. But, but just to you know, emphasize the point, this is still a, a single gravitational wave event and hopefully we will get many more in the future. Okay, so this is how you can actually combine information from electromagnetic and gravitational waves uh, from this binary neutron star to get constraints on cosmology. Um, but another thing that we can learn about gravitational waves is about dark energy, not just the expansion rate, but in particular, how does dark energy behave? Is it just a constant or is it something dynamical? So let me just review in, in two sentences. What do we know about how gravitational waves propagate in lambda CDM in the standard cosmological model? So I already said that the amplitude of the gravitational waves decays with the expansion of the universe. That's how we tested H naught through this one over luminosity distance factor. But the other important thing is that 
And the current cosmological model predicts that gravitation waves propagate at the speed of light. And, and these two points can actually be modified if you have some fundamental dark energy field that is interacting non trivially with gravity and giving some inference. So there are three main modifications that can happen in a lot of these alternative dark energy models. I don't want to talk about any single model in particular, just generically uh, what you can expect in, in a lot of them. So one is the fact that the amplitude of the gravitation waves can actually decay more or less. It's not, it doesn't just depend on the expansion of the universe, but it also depends on this dark energy in this dark energy field. So there can be like a different amount of friction, we typically call it, and uh, we typically parameterize by this parameter CM. The main idea is that different specific dark energy models are gonna predict different amounts of additional friction CM, different values of these parameters CM. And CM equal to zero means that there is no additional friction and the gravitational wave amplitude decays just like a one, one over this distance. But if CM is non-zero, then you know, it can decay more or less. So you have to imagine that this dark energy field is interacting with gravity and there could be some exchange of energy. And that's why the amplitude of the gravitational waves could decay more or less, depending on whether it loses or gains energy through dark energy. Um, then the other typical effect is that dark energy these dynamical dark energy models can change the propagation speed of gravitational waves, which we typically parameterize by this CT parameter. So this is the gravitational wave speed. This C is the speed of light. And when CT is equal to zero, we recover the current cosmological model where uh, they propagate at the speed of light. But if CT is non zero, then there could be something different. So again, this happens because we have this dark energy field interacting with gravity. And it could happen, for example, that a dark energy creates like a medium, an, an effective medium in which the gravitational waves propagate, and it would effectively change the speed, you know, as it happens for light propagating in a medium. And finally, the other rather common effect that can happen in these models is that there is a change in the dispersion relation of gravitational waves. So this is you know, very closely related to the change in velocity. So that's why I, we actually use the same name for the parameter that describes these deviations. We call it CT. But now the difference is that it can depend on, on frequency or wave number K. Um, so uh, the, I change, this is the dispersion relation of, of GR if CT is equal to zero. So omega is the temporal frequency, K is the wave number. It has like a typical dispersion relation at the speed of light. But if CT is non-zero, then it means that waves at different frequencies will propagate at different speeds and that translates into this modified dispersion relation. So these three effects we can constrain with gravitational waves. We have already done it and we can do it better in the future. So changes, for example, changes in the amplitude through the CM parameter, we can constrain by observing the amplitude of this gravitational wave signal. So in the same way that uh, we already constrain H naught because it affects the amplitude of the gravitational waves through this distance, we can test the CM. A, a change in the velocity can also be constrained. For example, if you have an emission of electromagnetic and gravitational wave signals at the same time, then you can compare their arrival time. So that can be done. In the case of the dispersion relation, if you have a, a change in the speed that depends on the frequency, then that will leave actual like distortions, kind of it will mess up your entire signal. I will show you a specific example and that's how you can you can actually constrain it. So let me I'm in the in the next slides, I'm gonna show these three cases and how we can use gravi this gravitational wave data. I'm sorry, Maka, there is a question. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess my question, well it's 
right about this slide. So in principle, you would get some constraints about things integrated along the line of sight or something like that, right? Okay. Like in Pulsar. Uh, so how, how is there some extra assumption in order to get like this more? Or am I completely off in that it would be some integrated quantity along the line of sight? Yeah, for example, it is correct that it's an integrated effect along the line of sight. Uh, for example, for the effect of the amplitude, you know, if you're, you do have to, uh, we do typically assume what is the temporal evolution of DCM. So DCM may not necessarily be a constant thing. It may be something that, you know, it varies with time. You have to make an assumption about that. But by measuring signals at different distances, you can probe that, that, that evolution. Um, but yeah, it's true that with, with one single event, yeah, you, you, you just have the total net effect and, and that's it. I think you're right. Thank you. Is there any other question? No, no, not so far. You can go on, thanks. Okay. Okay, so, so let's look at the case of, this is the easiest one, it's measuring the uh, propagation speed of gravitational waves and setting constraint on this parameter CT. Assuming that it doesn't depend on frequency or anything, just like an overall change in the speed. So before having gravitational wave, be, so I already, sorry, I already mentioned the 2017 neutron star merger where we detected both gravitational wave and electromagnetic radiation from the same source. Um, and how we can use it to constrain H naught. So we're gonna use the same one to set constraint on CT, on this deviation speed. But before that, there were already some constraints on the propagation speed. It, it cannot be anything. So it had, it had already this rather tight lower bound on how much slower it can be. But in the upper bound, it was like this 0.5 number, which is you know, considered like a rather bad upper bound on how much faster the gravitational waves can propagate with respect to the speed of light. So this event in 2017, in which we use gravitational wave observations, basically tightened this upper bound so that now there is a lower and upper bound that is of the same order 10 to minus 50. So this is what was obtained by the LIGO Virgo collaboration, which is the collaboration detecting gravitational wave sequence. So let me show you how, how that happened. So I already said that we have this binary neutral star that kind of explodes and we can detect the gravitational wave signal as a function of time. So here, instead of showing you the wiggles of the strain as a function of time, here we're plotting the frequency of the signal as a function of time that it looks usually like this, like this kind of cyan line that grows as the two black holes, sorry, the two neutron stars get closer to each other, the frequency grows. And here where it peaks, where the frequency peaks is when we typically believe that the merger happened. After the merger, the signal kind of decays very fast and most of the time so far, we don't see anything after the merger. So this is another way of, of observing the gravitational wave as a function of time. So this moment of the merger, the peak, we call it zero. No, just it's an arbitrary name for the merger time. So in these by neutral stars, at the time of the merger, we also expect this explosion that emits uh, radiation. And in particular, it would emit gamma rays. And this is another, um, detector that detects gamma rays. So this is electromagnetic radiation, not, not gravitational waves. And this is what they saw at that exact same time. So there was like some kind of background noise. And then at some point there is a peak and you know, people identify that this gamma ray came from the same place in the sky as this gravitational wave signal. So it was identified that they were coming from the same pair of neutron stars. Um, for this case, 
uh, this uh, signal of the gamma rays, as you can see, it arrived about two seconds after what we identified as the moment of the merger of for gravitational waves. So two seconds is actually a very small amount if you think that these sources are like, you know, billions of light years away. Um, so, so the constraint on the propagation speed comes from this. So it could be possible that the that the gamma ray arrived later than the than the gravitation wave peak because gravitation waves propagate faster than the speed of light. But still, two seconds, as I said, is a small amount, so it cannot propagate too much faster. It can only be 10 to minus 15 parts to the speed of light. Um, now, the fact that it arrived two seconds later is not in disagreement with general relativity that predicts that gravitation waves propagate at the speed of light. Uh, it could be that this delay in the gamma ray, which is due to some astrophysical reason, so as far as I understand, it is not known yet you know, how that would happen, but uh, very broadly, you can imagine that um, when these neutron stars merge, there is a very dense environment. So any radiation uh, that was generated has to escape from this dense environment, and it may take a while to make it like scattered. Um, so it may be delayed. Um, that's one of the possible reasons. So it is still open to the possibility that maybe CT is exactly zero and gravitational waves maybe do propagate exactly at the speed of light. You know, we, we have to, you know, keep getting more observations. Maga, I'm sorry, one, one question. I got I got confused. If, because in the beginning I understood you said that the gamma rays that, that two seconds is too short for the gamma rays to have arrived. But then I understood then that you have uh, been speaking about these gamma rays being delayed. So I, I I got confused whether they arrived too soon or too late. Yeah, so they arrived. So in general relativity and in vanilla astrophysics, we <laughs> would expect the explosion and the gamma ray to be emitted exactly at the moment of the merger. So we would have expect, you know, this peak in the gamma rays to happen exactly here at the same time zero. And it happened a little bit later than- Ah, um, okay, than so gravitational waves, gravitational waves should have uh, arrived at the same time as the gamma rays. That, that, is, your, that, that, that yes. is the delay you're talking about. Great, great, I understood. Thank yes. you very much. Yeah, so the fact that they arrived earlier than the peak of the gamma ray, could be that they, they propagate faster, but it's still the two seconds is not, it's a small amount, as I said, and if they are faster than the speed of light, they would all be, only be 10 to the minus 15 parts faster than the speed of light. Okay, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so, so I would say that this is like one of the cleanest probes of uh, you know, gravity or, or cosmology that we can do because like, you know, just compare time delays, like one of the easiest ones. But we can also do probe other things. So, however, coming back to dark energy, I already mentioned that a lot of these dark energy models as, make predictions that, uh, that tell you that the propagation speed of gravitation waves is different to the speed of light. So due to the single gravitation wave event in 2017, a lot of these models now are actually highly disfavored. In particular, when dark energy is an additional field that is a scalar field, there are like these different classes of how, as I said, the scalar field interacts with itself and with gravity. And a lot of these classes are actually disfavored so this Horndesky, it's this Horndesky model. You know, it's a particular model that you know, just to kind of scare you a little bit. This is like the Lagrangian looks very complicated. It has like a lot of freedom for you know all, all of the possible interactions that could be present. But just by imposing and focusing on the subclass of models in which the propagation speed is zero or very small, then you actually you know, get the, this model simplifies a lot. And the freedom of all of these interactions that were possible reduces a lot. So um, 
So now this is kind of different to the case of H0. In this case, a single event actually did have a lot of constraining power and gave us a lot of new information um, in terms of this dark energy model. So now let me talk about another, the, the other modification that I mentioned, which is the case, the case of the dispersion relation, which I already said, you know, it's, re it's related to the, uh, a change in the propagation speed, but that is now dependent on the wave number or frequency. And so there's one model that has also been mentioned as, as a proposed, you know, alternative interpretation to dark energy, which is, or, sorry, which is massive gravity. So in general relativity, you know, the, the, the graviton is a massless spin to particle. And in there are alternative models called massive gravity in which the graviton has a small mass. So in this case, the dispersion relation of gravitational wave is gonna change. So if we have a monochromatic wave with a given you know, temporal frequency and, and wave number, in massive gravity, this is the dispersion relation that we're gonna have. And I'm highlighting in blue here, the, the modification with respect to GR. So mg is the mass of the graviton, and a is the scale factor, which is telling you the expansion of the universe, which is something that we have to add here in this cosmological test. Um, but just from the dispersion relation, you can calculate the group velocity of these waves if you had like a wave packet. And assuming that the mass is small, then this group velocity is going to be approximately this. So you have like a you know some Taylor expansion in a small masses of graviton. And you have that the group velocity is gonna be C, the speed of light, minus this term that is always positive. So from here, you certainly get that the waves will always propagate slower than the speed of light, as expected for a massive particle. But the important thing is that this correction term that makes the speed slower depends on K depends on the wave numbers. So depending on the frequency will be more, more slower or less slower. Um, in particular, low frequency waves propagate slower. So the lower the frequency, the slower the propagation. And this is gonna introduce distortions in your signal, what we call phase distortion. So we have here this train as a function of time of a toy situation. This is not data or anything. So this is a model in which you have two black holes that have merged. And I, I know that I have a lot of lines here, but gray, which is here, is what you would de de uh, detect if there was no mass of the graviton. So what you detect in general relativity. So you detect little squiggles you know, from the in spiral, and then here the amplitude grows, which is the moment of the peak, and then the signal decays very fast. Now, if we did assume that the graviton had a small mass, like 10 to minus 23 electron volts, you would obtain blue, which is actually pretty close because this mass is too small for us to realize, you know, to, with the naked eye to, to see the difference. But, it, but in orange, you have a more extreme case. Well, it is still a low mass, I would say, but it's 10 to minus 22 electron volts. So now you obtain this orange thing, which is definitely different to gray to what you would expect in GR. And this happens again, because low frequency waves propagate slower. So the main reason why this happens is because in general relativity, these first wiggles here that come from the spiral, they have low frequency compared to the wiggles that arrive later here at the peak. So all of these initial wiggles that come from the spiral are arriving much later than expected here in, in the orange. Um, so in this case, in orange, you get like a squeezed kind of signal. And another case is green, which is if the mass was even a larger number, then you would obtain this, you know, completely different thing that, you know, it's obvious that, you know, it's, it, there's some modification of gravity or something. So, so these are what we call phase distortions, like, you know, basically the evolution of the, of the oscillations changes in time. And the fact that we have never observed any signal out of the 90 
currently detected, anything like that looks like green means that we can already set some constraints. So this is what the LIGO Virgo collaboration did. With these 90 detections, they already set a constraint that it was of the order of 10 to the minus 23 electron volts. So we are at the level of this blue line, which is as, as we already saw, even in the naked eye, we cannot, you know, it's difficult to see. But, you know, as a reference, uh, there are already much better constraints on this graviton mass from other kind of observations. For example, by observing clusters of galaxies, people have set constraints that are, you know, six orders of magnitude better. So again, so far, these gravitation wave constraints are possible to impose with current data. It doesn't, it doesn't assume anything else, it's just gravitation wave data alone. Uh, but they are not competitive with current constraints. However, in the future, we will be observing you know, to much better position and we'll have millions of these events. So I do think that maybe we will reach something at this level, like six orders to manage better. We'll have to see. Um, so, so, for example, these, these bounds set constraints on this massive gravity model. And that's going to affect, of course, you know, the cosmological predictions of this massive gravity model. Um, finally, the third modification, so this is the last slide, is this friction. What if through dark energy, gravitational waves are losing or maybe gaining energy during their propagation because you're exchanging energy with this dark energy field? So in order to constrain that, we have to follow the same procedure as we did before for H naught. So before we said the amplitude of the strain, you know, uh, that is related to how much energy you know these waves carry, decays as one over this luminosity distance. And I said that this luminosity distance you know, in the standard cosmological model it depends on the redshift, that is how far the source is, and the expansion rate H naught. But now if you have you know, this extra kind of mechanism to lose or gain energy, there is this extra parameter CM that, that is going to appear here in the in this effective distance. So, so we follow the same procedure, for example, for this event, a binary, binary neutron star is in 2017. You get a, from the gravitational wave signal, you obtain a value for, for the distance DL. And then from the electromagnetic counterpart, you can obtain a value for how far the source is, the redshift. That allows you to impose constraint. You could impose like some kind of joint constraint on H0 and CM, or you could impose constraint only on CM, assuming a certain value of H0, for example, based on the current cosmological observations that the plank or the shoes that I showed you. So, uh, we did an analysis like that, and for the 2017 neutron star, uh, here I'm quoting the results of the constraint. Basically, this is like the 68% uncertainty on the value CM. So CM equals zero <laughs> is the value that you expect in GR or in you know, your standard cosmological model. And, and this uncertainty tells you that, you know, it, you are 68% confident that it's between minus 30 and 30, uh, the value of CM, which is generally, I would say, a bad constraint because we can compare to other constraints that come from, an, from electromagnetic cosmological observations, from galaxy surveys and the cosmic microwave background. And people have already imposed constraints at a much higher position. So where the uncertainties are close to order one. So again, this is a single event that as a, as a proof of principle, we can show that it can help you constrain this dark energy friction parameter CM, but, but it's not still competitive. Um, however, there are different mechanisms in which people have proposed to constrain CM just using gravitational wave data from, you don't need an electromagnetic counterpart or anything. So people have proposed using binary black holes, uh, gravitational wave data, these 90 events that we have so far, and have found this kind of level of constraint. 
you know, it is still debated about all of the assumptions that they went into those constraints, uh, but, uh, you know, it, it may be, may be valid. However, in the future, of course, we do expect to have many more events. For example, if we had again, like a hundred of these binary neutral stars, instead of just a single one, with an electromagnetic counterpart, we could reach a level of precision on this constraint CM that is comparable to the current cosmological constraints. Um, also, there are, a, you know, if you had a thousand of binary black hole events and combine that information with some galaxy surveys, so these are different ways not using just gravitational wave data alone, but kind of comparing and using all the possible data that you can imagine. So if you had in the future, a thousand gravitational wave events, which actually could happen in I don't know, a few years, four years maybe, using, combining with these galaxy sur surveys and maps that I showed you, maybe you could reach a constraining CM that is you know, at this one or magnitude better than current values. And again, if we think of like the next gener the, the next decade gravitational wave detectors, there are some constraints using everything, like combining gravitational waves, plus galaxies, plus cosmic micro background, you could reach also one or two orders of magnitude better constraints. Now, in terms of what is this gonna mean for dark energy, I would say like naturally these dark energy models predict that CM would be some order one number. So, so these kind of all of the present constraints don't actually say much about them, but reaching this kind of level of 0 0.01, then they could start, you know, constraining some of these theoretical models. So at least for this kind of probe, uh, you know, the main message is that the best constraints are going to be reached when you combine everything. Like, do not, you don't want to use only gravitational wave data or only electromagnetic waves, you have to use everything together. So these are, you know, different examples. And this is just yes, my summary with this I finish. So Lambda CDM is a, is a current cosmological model and has been very successful as a phenomenological model, but it still relies on a lot of kind of theoretical unknown ingredients of dark energy or dark matter. And I try to convince you that gravitational waves are sensitive to cosmology through their propagation and can be used either as some kind of independent probe to constrain gravity or dark energy, or you can actually complement it to electromagnetic observations to reach the best constraints. So I mentioned the case of H0 using binary neutral stars. I also mentioned constraints on the gravitational wave speed the fact that the single gravitational wave event with an, a gamma ray burst gave us like the best constraints that we have so far on the gravitational wave speed. Um, I show you the case of constraints on dispersion relations. And finally, this kind of dark energy friction effect that you know we so far is not very constrained, not very well constrained, but in the future will be if we combine all of the data that we can have. So that would be all. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Maga. Thanks for the effort of giving this talk while a little bit sick. Um, we do have time for some questions. I do have some, but please, if other people have, please raise your hand and uh, you can ask freely. Can, uh, can you stay for the discussion, Maga, or, or not? If not, uh, please uh, hurry to make questions <laughs> to Maga because this is, <laughs> this is your, your, your time. Okay, Ale, go ahead. Okay, no, thank you. Thank you for the colloquium. Um, I had a, a couple of questions, different level of... Uh, uh, sophistication, but just one, I know that you were focusing on gravitational waves and then, but then at the beginning you were kind of giving an overview of what other experiments and probes there are. And I was just curious uh, uh, if the James Webb's telescope in any way has an imprint uh, on this uh, cosmological models, like would we learn anything given that it has had so much attention on the news 